Welcome to this series FileMaker and Craft Databases. My name is Joris Aerts from Clickworks. We are a FileMaker Platinum business partner based in Belgium, in Antwerp. You can find the example files on our website, clickworks.eu. We have a channel on YouTube, you're watching it right now. And you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and so on. Now, this is the first video of a series of four. And first, I'd like to explain what is a graph. I can already tell you um, it has nothing to do with charts. Um, it's a specific database technology. So in this first uh, and maybe the longest video, I will explain you uh, the concept of graph databases, how they are different from FileMaker and why they can be of interest to us FileMaker developers. Then in the second video, uh, I'd like to show you how to import FileMaker data in a graph database and what the benefits are of, do of doing that and of having your data in a graph. Uh, in the third video, I will show you how to update the graph once your data are in a graph database, how to update the graph from within FileMaker. And finally, I'd like to make an attempt in the fourth video uh, to get rid of FileMaker native tables and to use a graph database as a FileMaker backend database. So the only role that FileMaker will uh, perform is being a front end for a graph backend database. Let's see how this goes. Now, first, what is a graph? And maybe let's ask the first question, why? Why should we uh, talk about this new concept of databases? Well, um, you see this LinkedIn page uh, on the right hand side. And you have probably also been wondering, like, how do these guys do that? This is actually my profile page and you see a list of recommended uh, people. So based on the contacts I already have, a couple of hundred contacts, uh, LinkedIn is suggesting me new persons that I might know. And I even can see how many people in my network are connected to these possible uh, new contacts. And I was watching this and I was asking myself, how, how do they do that? Can I do that with FileMaker? Well, what's, what's the difference? And to show you how this works, I'd like to go to my uh, real LinkedIn page. And maybe you also noticed if you have a LinkedIn profile that you can continue scrolling. And as you are scrolling, uh, actually new results are dropping in. And I've been testing this out for you. I've been scrolling all day long and I can assure you new results are coming in all the time all the time and i was wondering uh, how, how do these guys do that and and can i do that with with FileMaker? but i soon found out that the types of queries they are needed to do these kinds of recommendations or to build a so-called recommendation engine are actually huge suppose that i have a couple of hundred uh, contacts my 600 contacts are my so-called uh, inner circle, that's the, the green circle over here. Well, each of my contacts can also have a couple of hundred people they know, and that will be an outer circle of more than 360,000 uh, people that I have to search. And then I have to do the ranking to show the best matches or the, the, the persons that are known by multiple persons in my inner circle. I have to show the best matches first. So I'm querying all the time on, on hundreds of thousands of possible uh, new people I might know and I'm ranking links based on the number of connections So this is a lot of queries going on there and it's it's happening live before my eyes And I'm not the only user of LinkedIn. There are thousands and millions of people all over the globe doing that Can we do that with FileMaker? Possibly not and I was wondering myself is, is it FileMaker's fault? Uh, and I don't, don't think so. I, I quickly found out that there's a spe special kind of databases needed or a special technology needed to have these kind of optimized recommendation engines. And that's a graph database. So what LinkedIn is using and what also, uh, Walmart and Amazon are using, for instance, to do suggestions are databases that store their, their data uh, differently, different than from what we are used to do in FileMaker. FileMaker is a so-called classic database or, or, or a so-called relational database management system or RDBMS and this is good this is fine uh, for several things uh, FileMaker is not alone there's also Oracle MySQL Microsoft SQL Server and so on and so on and we are all used to build tables and records and to have primary keys and foreign keys 
But apparently, for this kind of recommendation engines, this data structure is not optimal. So what does a graph database do? And I'm borrowing some uh, images from Neo4j with their per permission. And I'm also referring uh, to Neo4j as one particular graph database technology. Uh, why? Not because I'm a salesperson for Neo4j, but because they have a very easy to use and free to use desktop edition that I'm going to show you further on. Okay, so I use this database technology from Neo4j as an example, but Amazon and Microsoft have their own equivalent of graph databases. So Neo4j is not alone, but they are probably the first to make graph databases popular. Now, back to the topic. What's the main difference between a graph database and uh, a FileMaker or a traditional relational database? Well, a graph database doesn't store tables and records. They store nodes. And these nodes are visible here. And at the time, they are storing nodes on disk. They do that in a way that they also store the relationships with other nodes directly with the node in a very efficient way. Uh, so that once you are on a starting node, you have almost at a hardware level immediate access to the surrounding nodes. Okay, they call this index free adjacency. Once you're on a node, you have ultra fast access to the surrounding nodes without having to do index based searches, foreign key searches uh, in, in a table. Okay, they call it a pointer chasing. And I understand this as a simple file maker developer. I, I understand this as like putting a bunch of squirrels on one node and ask these guys to run around, follow all the choice or all the relationships to other nodes and come back with the results from one or two or multiple hubs away uh, in my network. Okay, so it's a different way of storing data. At the right time, the data is connected as it is stored. That's the main difference between a graph database and a file maker database. And it has certain benefits. One of the most important benefits is that the size of data, the size of your data set, doesn't matter that much as it does with a traditional database. So traditional databases, not only file makers, it's not file makers fault, but traditional databases tend to go slower when the size of the data grows. That's because these index updates take longer and lower, and also these index-based queries take longer and longer. Okay, and so this is like an exponential line, whereas a graph database doesn't suffer that much from the size of your data, because once you have found your starting node, and that's still an index-based search, but once you are on your starting node, you put these squirrels on your node and they run around and they can be in a sea of data, but it doesn't matter. Once they're on the starting node, they can very rapidly access the surrounding node. So this is a linear line, okay? So the impact of the size of data is not that heavy as it is for traditional databases. So at Neo4j, they call this the minutes to milliseconds advantage. Another advantage of a graph database is that certain types of queries are much easier to do in a graph database than in a traditional database. So let's take a look at this simple question in an employee uh, database. Who reports to a manager named John Doe? And how many people report to these managers? So what's their head, head count? So I need to go through the hierarchy of my organization to find uh, all people below a certain manager and then to count all the employees that report to these people. Okay, And so to do this kind of hierarchical searches, this will take a lot of uh, queries or sub-queries in a traditional uh, SQL environment. So this is a real uh, SQL statement. Whereas in a graph database, the query you will need to do is much simpler. This is actually a query language called OpenCypher. It's open source, but it has been founded by the guys of Neo4j. And this question is actually not that hard to read in this query language. Um, so you see the starting node is the manager named John Doe. 
is called the boss. Boss name is John Doe. That's the where statement. It's like in uh, SQL. Okay. Instead of a select statement, you have a match statement. So based on this starting node, I'm going to follow the relationship, the manager's relationship. So this is a relationship. It's literally an arrow pointing uh, to um, other nodes. So I'm going to follow three hops away all the people that report to this boss that, that are his managers. Okay. Then I'm doing that again based from these managers. I'm going again three hops away to all the people that report to them. Okay. I'm showing um, the subordinates and I'm showing the headcount of the people reporting to them. So this is a very short statement to do exactly the same thing as you would do with this very long uh, SQL statement. So certain types of queries are easier and more efficient in a graph than in a traditional relational database management system. Who uses graph databases, and in particular Neo4j? Well, the Panama Papers have been explored using a graph database. NASA uses it to prepare for its uh, mission to Mars. eBay uses it, and so on, and so on. Gartner and Forrester have been mentioning graph databases as a technology to invest in. And I would like you to show you an example from the Panama Papers, because this is a well-known topic. So at a certain point in time, a journalist receives a hard drive, 2.6 terabytes of data, emails, address lists, bank statements, and so on. And they actually build a surprisingly simple graph database from it. So they created a few different types of nodes. You have, for instance, person nodes. And a person can live at a certain address. So these are address nodes. And there is a lives at relationship between this person and its address. So a person can live at a certain address, but can also be officer in a company that is registered in another address. Maybe an offshore address, maybe somewhere on the Bahamas, right? Or another person can have a bank account or an account with a company that's also registered somewhere offshore. And that's basically the essence of the Panama Papers. So the database itself is, is very, uh, the structure is very uh, simple, but the possibilities are very powerful. And I'd like to show you that. Uh, and I'm going to use Queen Elizabeth as an example. She has been mentioned in the Panama Papers. Doesn't mean she's guilty, found guilty for something, but she has been mentioned in the Panama Papers. And I'd like to show you that example. The Queen operates with a private estate firm called the Duchy of Lancaster. And that's how we can find her in the Panama Papers. I'd like to show you that. If you want, you can actually download a so-called runtime version of Neo4j to explore the Panama Papers. Just Google um, Neo4j Panama Papers and you will find this runtime solution, Neo4j Desktop for ICIG. This is the International Consortium uh, for Investigative Journalism. And I'm going to run this app. It's a Java app, so it runs on a Mac or on a PC. Okay, and so there is a browser for dummies, but I like to go immediately to the native Neo4j browser. This allows me to reveal the different types of nodes that exist in this database and the different relationship types. So for instance, registered address and so on. Okay, and I already prepared one query for you how the queen is involved. Let me zoom in a little bit. So this is the starting node, Duchy of Lancaster. Okay. So I'm going to find officers, so nodes of type officer, uh, where name equals Duchy of Lancaster to find my starting node. And then I'm basically asking to follow relationships up to two hops away and to return me all the nodes. So I'm putting the nodes I find in a variable called x and then I say okay return me the starting point so the queen herself and x so all the surrounding nodes. 
Now to show you this step by step, I'm going to start with one hop away and run this query. And this is the result. So actually there are two investments, officer of, one Kaiman fund, and another company called Jubilee Absolute Return, based in Bermuda. Okay, and now let's go one more hop away to find nodes two hops away from the starting node. And you can see what's going on. This is not that interesting, but this Jubilee Absolute Return, this company, is actually there are a lot of uh, co-officers and they all have their address registered on, on the same place somewhere on the fifth floor in uh, on the, in a building in in bermuda okay this head office and i can now ask to go one more hop further so three levels deep but i can also just double click on this node to reveal what's behind this one and this is a very intuitive way to explore uh, this database so i double click on this head office and then you see what's going on i'm going to maximize this window and to give you an id let's excuse me let's me zoom out so this was my starting point the area is jubilee absolute return and as you can see all these people are so-called consultants all registered on the same address all the red dots are other companies that are also located on the same address so this is basically the essence of, of the panama papers and a graph database allows me in a very visual way to explore this kind of data and you can do that yourself just google panama papers neo4j so with that i'd like to end the first panama papers demo let me now show you how to start a new graph database from scratch i downloaded the free neo4j desktop edition it's a fully functional version for mac windows or android you can download it from the website it also runs in java and when you download it you get an empty project page so i have two sample databases here but to create a new graph i just click here add graph i'm going to create one locally on my machine Let's call this my first graph. Enter the password and I click create. Okay, database is there. There are no nodes yet, no relationships yet. I'm going to start the management console, a bit like the FileMaker server management console. And you see the database engine is stopped right now. So I start it here. It is running on my local machine. And if I want to access it later over HTTP or HTTPS, I can use these port numbers. So these are basically the ports if I want to talk from within FileMaker to this graph. These are the ports and the address hostname uh, I need to use. Now they have a built-in query browser. So I'm going to start this one. We already saw it to explore the Panama Papers. Okay. And this is where you start and as you can see there are no tables to, def to define, no fields to define, you just enter uh, your queries but it's actually pretty simple so don't be afraid. Suppose that I want to create a simple graph of my organization, Clickworks, and I want to uh, create uh, two of my co-workers in the database, I just use the create statement. A node is represented by rounded uh, uh, brackets. Okay, so I want to create a node of type person and let's say that I want to uh, enter my friend Jan. So I'm going to use Jan as a variable name and I'm going to create a node of type person with certain properties. So properties are within curly brackets, my name property for instance, and my colleague is called Jan Steep. So this is how you create a node of type person with one property and how you put this node in a variable to refer to later. Now in the same sentence I can also uh, define a relationship. This is a simple dash. And then between square brackets I can enter the relationship name. For instance works for and I'm using this as a variable to refer to the relationship later on. 
Now I need another dash and then a greater than sign. This is literally an arrow. So this is basically ASCII art. Okay, this is a node. And this is a relationship. It's a directed relationship. Jan works for... And now I need to create a second node, the company Clickworks. So I'm going to create CW for Clickworks. It will be a node of type company with also a name, property. Okay, so I have one person node, one company node, one relationship. And to show you the result, I can say, okay, now return me, Jan, and return Clickwork. So these are the aliases or the variable names I just declared over here. And if I run this query, I just created two nodes in one relationship. So it's not that hard. And as you can see, you have complete freedom. There are no predefined tables, no fields to define, no primary key and foreign keys. You just create nodes and relationships. So let's add another colleague uh, to Clickworks. I'm going to reuse the same uh, query. So I'm going to create myself, for instance, Joris. I also work for Clickworks, but this time the node already exists, so I don't need to create the node again. And I'm going to combine two statements. So I'm going to cut the company nodes and I'm entering a line to find these nodes. So if I say match the company named Clickworks, I can use this variable to refer to an existing company. So now I'm creating a second person, but I'm linking it to an existing company. And so a second person node has been created and linked to the same company node by using the match statement. So if I go take a look at my database structure, I now have two works for relationships. So this is the complete database right now. I have both myself and Jan working for Clickworks. Okay. So this was just a simple uh, example to show you how easy it is to get started with a graph database. Okay, now let's take a look at some built-in examples. So I'm going to close my queries and uh, I'd like to show you these building tutorials. There is one jump into code and I'm going to use this one. And it's based on a simple movie graph. So you get a guided tour and in this step actually they build a little graph database on the fly. So you see 500 lines of code to create all kinds of nodes of type uh, actor, movie, and then acted in relationship. So if I run this query, you see one example popping up. Let me display the names of the persons. And then you see an example query uh, for Tom Hanks, the movies Tom Hanks has played in, and Tom Hanks co-actors. Okay, and so they use this a small movie database as an example file for some more advanced queries. Okay, now these are basic examples, finding a node. This is a more complex example, find movies from the 90s. So you see this where close, that's similar to how you use where in uh, SQL. And I get a list of uh, movies from the 90s. Now, to show all movies for Tom Hanks, for instance, I'm starting on a person node with property name Tom Hanks. I'm using the match statement to find the starting node. Then I'm following the acted in relationships and all the surrounding nodes are put in a variable called Tom Hanks movies. So I can now say return Tom and Tom Hanks movies. And so this will give this typical star pattern or the inner circle, the movies Tom Hanks played in. Okay, and if we take this one step further, I can find Tom Hanks co-actors just by starting on the same node, following the acted in relationship until I find uh, all Tom Hanks movies, and then following the acted in relationships in the opposite direction to find Tom Hanks co-actors. And I can return the name, and I, I get a list of names, so just a name property, or I can say return 
Tom Hanks himself. His movies, that's this one, this variable. And his co actor so not only the name property, but the notes. And so then you get this pattern, Tom Hanks, his movies, and then his co-actors. So these are pretty basic examples. Uh, let's take this one step further. This query is actually a recommendation engine. So suppose we know Tom Hanks co-actors. This is the same query as we had before. Okay. Now I want to suggest new uh, players, new co-players for Tom Hanks. So what I'm going to do is uh, I have this inner ring of uh, co-actors for Tom Hanks. And from this inner ring, I'm going to follow again the acted in relationship, find their movies and find their co-actors. So these are Tom Hanks co co-actors, or this is the outer ring of uh, actors around Tom Hanks. Okay, and among these co-co-actors, there might be people where Tom Hanks has not yet been uh, playing with. Okay, so this is so we are not close to uh, remove people uh, in the co-co-actors ring that already have played with Tom Hanks. And of course, he himself cannot appear in the results uh, neither. Okay, and then I return these names. So all co-co-actors that have not yet played with Tom Hanks as recommended. And this is very powerful. I can actually perform a count on the number of relationships I find and order them by the number of relationships. So I can call this strength and order by strength in descending order. So the result will be a list of names of potential co-actors for Tom Hanks that have not yet played with Tom Hanks, but in the case of Tom Cruise here, for instance, there are five of Tom Hanks co-actors that already have played with Tom Cruise, but Tom Hanks himself has not. And as you can see, this all happens in a few milliseconds, so it's fairly efficient. This is uh, the efficiency of uh, pointer chasing. So this, now you see a, a recommendation engine at work in, in a graph database, and I'm beginning to see how a graph is different from FileMaker and how these kinds of queries are much more efficient in a graph than in FileMaker. So with this example, I'd like to uh, end the demo, or the first demo of uh, Neo4j, and return to uh, what is a graph and other scenarios. So for instance, uh, finding a cure for cancer, it's uh, a disease that requires new technologies to literally uh, connect the dots because uh, for instance, medical data can be stored in separate data silos. You have, for instance, pharmaceutical data, genetic data, patient records, and so on. They are all in their, their own systems and their own databases. With a graph database, you can actually extract information from all these data silos and connect the different dots or connect the different nodes in a way that allows you to find new ways to cure a disease like cancer. Other scenarios that are very well suited for graph databases, so we already saw the recommendation engines, real-time recommendations, uh, for instance, used by Walmart. Fraud detection will be shown in the next video where I'm importing data from FileMaker in a graph. And there are other domains like network IT operations, master data management, and so on, and so on. So these are scenarios where a graph database uh, fits very well. There's actually a very interesting video on YouTube, seven ways your data is telling you it's a graph. So if you've ever been building a database in FileMaker and you have the feeling that the relational model of FileMaker is, is, is working rather against you than, than with you, then watch this video. I can already tell you one of the reasons or one of the ways your data uh, tells you it needs a graph is if your queries are very complicated and very slow. Now let's summarize what is a graph. So we already saw uh, that we don't need tables uh, and fields and primary key and foreign keys in a graph. You just 
create nodes and you connect nodes using uh, plenty of relationships, uh, you're free to use them. They are not as costly as in a traditional database since you don't need joint tables, you don't need foreign keys. The query language Cypher, it's literally ASCII art on the left hand side. You see a node between parentheses, a dash represents the relationship, a greater than sign represents the direction or the arrow, and then on the other side you have the opposing node. So for instance, to represent uh, two persons or to find uh, who is married to a person named Dan, I can use the match statement, find a node with a property named Dan, node of type person, so this is the label, this is a property. I can follow the married to relationship, oh, excuse me, I can follow the married to relationship to find uh, the node on the other side. I don't know who that is, but I can put it in a variable name spouse and I can say return spouse to find uh, who is married to Dan. So this is uh, one relationship. Now since relationships are uh, very cheap in a graph database I can create all kinds of relationships. So in this example you see that Dan is not only married to Anne but he also lives with her and she owes a car and he can drive it but only since 2011. So as you can see, relationships can also have properties in a graph. This is something very particular and can come in very handy in certain scenarios. So you can also, for instance, timestamp certain relationships. Imagine for criminal investigation how you can timestamp all the phone calls that one person does to another person. So to end this summary, the main thing a graph does fundamentally different from what we are used to in a relational database. They store nodes, they store relationships in a very efficient way so that if you find a starting node, you can immediately have access to the surrounding nodes and you can do lightning fast so-called pointer chasing. This is called index free adjacency. It's the minutes to milliseconds advantage in very large databases. And to and I'd like to show you how graph databases are becoming a trend only fairly recently. So only a couple of years ago they started to literally take off. So these are data from uh, the website pbengines.com. So they measure the uh, popularity of different database engines based on the number of times they are mentioned on social media and so on. So as you can see this red line represents the traditional relational databases like Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, and also FileMaker, they are the biggest. They are there, they are not going away, but they are not uh, becoming very popular or their popularity is not changing very much. Whereas graph databases are really rising. And with this, I'd like to end this uh, first video of the series. So this video was uh, to explain you what is a graph and in the next video I will show you how to import FileMaker data in a graph.